I was born on the 17th day of January, 1846. I go back as far as way along in the early 50s. My first recollection of public living, and especially political living, as I may call it, was when I learned as a boy of nine or 10 that my home was in, in the state of Virginia. I didn't know about states before that time. Then time passed pretty rapidly because I was attending high school. And I remember distinctly the occasion when the John Brown, the poor man, sought freedom for the slaves. Is that in my state? I heard about it pretty distinctly. I felt sorry and yet sympathizing with my elders, I felt some resentment. Now, while some in my section, Southeast Virginia, I knew of some brutality, as I call it, exercised towards some of the Negro slaves. As a whole, the Negroes got along very well. Now, my father's Negroes. I associated with them. That being the baby of the family, I didn't have any white children for associates. Therefore, I played around with the Negro children. Four years passed by. Then came up the great struggle when the Republican Party had become a, a power in the land. In 1860, Mr. Lincoln was elected, as you know. And I remember that uh, there was a good deal of excitement in my section, that the Negro slavery would be interfered with. Negroes would be set free and all that. Well, I didn't feel much interest about it because I, I felt kind of toward the doctors and they were kind of toward me and toward my family. <clears throat> now, I was attending school, as I said, and when in the spring, spring of 61, when uh, news came that war was actually declared, in fact, it had been coming when South Carolina, as we heard, seceded from the Union. Well, wonder now what Mr. Lincoln will do when he is uh, seated on the presidential chair. Well, there was a variety of feeling about it, even among our 75 or 100 young men, boys, at school. But right at once, and what was declared, about half of our pupils, young men over 18, quit school, joined companies of uh, infantry, cavalry, and in their homes, in surrounding counties, and in that vicinity. I wanted to go too, but my father said, now son, you're too young. I was just 15. Just a little past. And if the war continues long enough, you may have an opportunity. Well, so I rested. And the war began. And I heard about it. And I heard that at the Battle of Williamsburg, some of my classmates fell in the battle there. Well, I grieved about that because they were boys that I'd been brought up with. They were a little older than I. But I felt sorry that they were killed. Then, in 62, although General Lee had still a pretty good army, he began to need more men, naturally. Although the big battles, or the largest battles, had not come yet. But my neighbors around there, some of them who were over 45, kinsmen of mine, some of them, began to uh, just get up, to get up a, a company of cavalry. And I, a boy of 16 and a half years old, joined the cavalry company, which afterwards was attached and counted with others among the 24th Virginia Cavalry. Now, for a long time then, from August 62 on, until 64, great battles had been fought in there. We heard of the Battle of Gettysburg. And finally, our corps, our camp company, was taken away from the Blackwater border, guarding this, that section of the country from the incursions of federal soldiers who might cross the Blackwater River 
and the Chuan and come over into Confederate territory. We were taken in the spring of 64, our regiment was, uh, in the neighborhood of Petersburg. And while we were camped just north of Petersburg, General Grant began his invasion of that part of Virginia. We heard about it, and I remember very distinctly one morning we heard that General Lee had crossed James up north and was coming down the Turnpike Road to, in the direction of Petersburg, just near us. And the next morning, happening to look, while I was on guard, across the James River, there we saw long lines of blue. Uh, the infantry of the, of the Army and the United States flags on the other side of the James coming down to the beyond the mouth of the Appomattox River that flows into the James and in order to cross on the pontoon bridges and thus begin the invasion of that part of Virginia and in the city of Petersburg. Thus, I was not with that part of the army. My regiment was moved up north of Virginia, out of Richmond, I mean north of Richmond, and thus we guided that city for several months while General Lee and General Grant were struggling there near Petersburg. While that was going on, there were some skirmishes and one, well, small battle I was in. I was not in any of the large, larger battles, probably fortunately, maybe unfortunately. Well, General, uh, General Ewell commanded the, the General Lee's corps, near Richmond, and I remember we were called up one day and took the Derby Town Road and some mile or two, I don't know, we never counted distances or time in those days. <clears throat> we turned off from the road, made a road, and went down a road through a wood. After a while, I came to an opening, and there was a line of blue boys and with some artillery, and we charged them, and that's where I was struck the first and only time in my leg, which laid me up uh, two months. I was sent home on furlough. Now, I want to bring in one or two little points there that might be of interest to some. We were around Richmond, my regiment was, all the time then, and doing little or nothing, while the war was still going on. And after a while, a Saturday evening, the first day of April, 1865. We were ordered, and by the way, in the meantime, about half of my regiment had lost their horses. The Confederate soldiers owned their own horses, and when they lost a horse, it was difficult at that stage to secure a substitute. Anyhow, I lost mine. I've forgotten just now how. I don't, don't, believe, I don't believe it was in battle, however, at that time. Now, orders came for a dismounted part, or demounted, I might say, of the regiment to fall in line and march. We stopped on the way and spent the night. That is Saturday night. The next day was a beautiful day, Sunday. We didn't know what was going on. We were, we were within a mile of Richmond, and there was a turmoil there. And that day, as you all know, that day, the, uh, President Davis was attending his usual services at his church, St. Paul's Church. Right in the midst of the sermon, the door, front door opened, and a courier rushed in and read it, went up to President Davis, handed him the paper. He opened it, and it was a dispatch from General Lee saying, Mr. President, I am so heavily pressed by the enemy, that I'm compelled to abandon Petersburg. Mr. Davis arose and left, and the, the public, the uh, congregation broke up, and in a few minutes almost, it was pandemonium then in Richmond. We marched out of Richmond early the next morning, on the 3rd, 
and started in a southeasterly direction. Uh, we didn't know which way, uh, which way you know, where we were going, but afterwards it showed that we were attempting, under General Ewell's command, to uh, come in contact with General Lee somewhere down uh, southwest of Petersburg. Well, the Federals under General Sheridan overtook us, our command of about 3,000, at in Emilia, at in Emilia County, Virginia, and after fighting several hours, why General Ewell surrendered us, and thus I became a captive. I went to prison along with this command, and we landed in Point Lookout, Maryland, down here. And the day after we reached there, as a curious boy, I rose pretty early. We just gotten there the afternoon before. I rose pretty early and went out to see how things looked around in there. Was a, there were 20,000 of us, a large encampment. Happening to look across in one direction, I don't know which, well, there was a flagpole and a flag on it just rising. I stopped and looked at it with curiosity. It stopped when it got halfway. Well, I knew what halfway uh, flag on a pole meant. I looked at it and thought, well, the rope that handles that flag must have a knot in it, and I'll see a man presently going up that pole to untangle it. I waited a whole minute, and I casually turned my face in another direction, and there was another flag pole with flag half mast already. So I put my head in the tent. Uh, there were five, six others of us. I said, boys, there must be some big Yankee dead. I wonder who it can be. Of course, we had no means of knowing. And then we waited for about an hour. The sergeant blew a bugle. We, 150 of my company, fell in. And as soon as he finished calling our name, a number of us rushed up and said, Sergeant, what does the half flag mean? He stays still. He says, President Lincoln was shot last night. Well, the, uh, the feeling, the variety of feeling that came over us 20,000 men in just that one. Of course, there were several other prisoners, as you know. But as for me, and a boy, just 19, I didn't know what to think. I couldn't feel any hatred toward Mr. Lincoln, especially. I didn't feel any special hatred toward any federal soldier. And when I began to think of how kindly General Grant afterwards on the 9th acted toward General Lee, I, uh, I felt kindly toward him. Now, comes up the question of what we Southern soldiers fought for. My friends, as a boy of 16 and a half years old, I didn't think about any of abolition of slavery. My mind wasn't developed enough to take in what the politicians had in mind. And hence, there was no trouble as to the freedom of the slaves. About half of the Negroes, my father's Negroes, left and went to Norfolk to be under, as they considered, protection. But another half, 40, 50 of them, remained there and cultivated the crops until after the war. The South did not fight for the preservation or extension of slavery. General Lee, as is well known, was making arrangements to free his Negroes, and his father-in-law had already drawn up a part of his will, free his Negroes. My friend, it was a great curse on this country that we had slavery, and I thank God that I did not bring up my boys and girls under a system of slavery under which I was brought under. What did you boys fight for then? Here's what great many people do not know. That as a young man that way, I couldn't understand it fully. But I look back now and see my heart in it and saw what we struggled for. And that was for states' rights or states' rights. And as that many of you know, immediately after the war, the rights of the various states, well, especially in the South, were very much curtailed, if I may use that word. And since then, I have noticed, you let things come up, 
that encroach on the ordinary states' rights which we have preserved, and we find that the North, the boys at war, the blue are with us in preservation of the states' rights. of our worthy friend and uh, comrade Captain uh, Louis, Dr. Lewis, and uh, I will do the best I know how to get that hell up for you. What few of us old corn feds are left, we'll do all we can. We can't give you much, but we'll give you what we got left. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of announcing to you that we're going to make an effort to repeat the old rebel yell. One, two, three! I'll give you the individual there, Captain James Dinkin. <laughs>
1861, I enlisted in the War of the Rebellion at Warsaw in Benton County, Missouri, under Colonel O'Kane, then a captain. We went to Cold Camp, fought the Dutch, and cleaned them out completely. Lost only seven of our men with more than 250 of the Dutch killed. No prisoners were taken on either side. From there, we went to Springfield, Missouri, where we had the Battle of Wilson Creek, where General Lyon was killed on the 10th of August. The bravest man I ever saw was General Lyon. After he was completely surrounded and pulled off of his horse, he picked up rocks and fought with thousands of men around him. He struck Will Morgan in the face with a rock, and John Morgan shot him with an old-fashioned horse pistol. Kill him. How old are you? I'm 94. 94, pretty good age for a young man. Yes, sir. Kid. Yes. No, you got me all right. So how old are you? 84. 84. You was in the same? In the same war. On the same general. On the same general. General Price. That's a good, fine old man, too. Good man. Good man he was. Yes, he was. And we there to stay. We, we didn't enlist for a month or a year, but we enlisted for the war. We lived or lost the war last That's right. Having a good time here today? Fine. We're having a good time. Enjoying ourselves. Enjoying ourselves very much. We had a good dinner, too. I am the last boy of Bill that went away in 61 to fight for the Union. Now they are all gone, and I am ready to go to play here with my comrades. Give us a smile. Take a laugh. Don't blame me, I'll tell you another one. <laughs> That's all right. What? Oh, what to say, it was Connie. Well, I know it, but now you boys, comrades, all had experience. Uh, I don't know whether you ever heard of this experience. Sure. I was on picket duty. Now, if that ain't the truth, I'll tell you another one. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with your picket chickens? And Anna Bar come along, oh. and he wouldn't stop when I told him to, and I shot him. <laughs> Next night, there was two fellas coming along on my hands and knees, and they wouldn't stop, and I, I shot the both of them. <laughs> then about two months after, was put on the same boat, but you wouldn't brave it, it was three fellas coming along. Shut up, boy. Oh, no, hold on. No. You got back to camp and put down the chest. No, it's not. They shot me. <laughs> 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 I told you to do that. Well, keep your feet down. Well, well, what do you think I am? I can't it. It's hard to guess. Well, all right. You gotta pay for me. That's all right, too. Come. Yeah. Come Boys and girls, 62 years ago. My Corps Commander, John A. Logan, issued an order that this 30th of May should be used as Memorial Day in honor of the soldiers that fought during the Civil War. And every year since that, we have been observing this day. 
and it's spread all over the country. The boys, the girls, the men, and the women everywhere are scattering flowers all over all the graves. It began this morning when the sun rose and it spread all over the United States. So there you go, a of graves, flying, the flags are flying, and the flowers are being distributed. And everybody is happy over the great war of the rebellion. Veterans of the Blue and the Gray of the United States, I accept this monument in the spirit of brotherhood and peace. <laughs>